Hello, hello, hello. Good morning to you, good afternoon, or good evening to you, no matter part of the world that you are in. I bring you greetings from the United States in the great state of Michigan, aka known as the Minton State, and you are watching Get Into It. It is a podcast that is really diving into cancer conversations, with cancer survivors, with doctors, with oncologists, uh, with caregivers. And we really just dive into this ugly thing called cancer. And I am your host, Kimberly Willis, and I am your wellness advocate. And I help provide different products and services to you. I am an author, so I help encourage and inspire you. I have motivational shirts such as this to help give you something to um, be inspired when you wear things, when you're going through your battle with cancer. But I don't stop there. I also provide fragrances for both men and women. I make you smell good, y'all, but there's so much more that I do. But make sure that you follow me right here at survivorscorner.net. There you can find things such as this if you need to be styled, um, or even if you just want to follow me on Instagram or Facebook or even on LinkedIn, whatever channel that you're looking at, Please just make sure you like, comment, and share this podcast because you do not want to miss who we're getting ready to introduce and talk about for this show. I'm really excited to have her. We we have an international show. We have an international guest, guys. This is like amazing. I know that we were having get, um, viewers all over the world, but to be able to have a guest is really special because especially in this virtual space, to be able to um, just to be able to share our cancer experience globally really means a lot. So I want to read a little bit of the bio of our guest today. And it says this, Andy Kale is full of enthusiasm and passion. She shares her experience being motivated and driven by the smile she creates in others. She considers herself just to be a regular girl who happens to have a passion for motorsports, specifically drag racing. But in 2010, that passion was put on hold after being diagnosed with aggressive breast cancer and that focus and determination to get behind the wheel of her drag racing car and the support of the motorsport community around her is what helped not only her, but also her husband through the worst days of her cancer treatment. And before we bring her on, I do want to show a little clip about who she is. This drag racer is looking to speed up the battle against breast cancer. Andy Kale's Therapy on Wheels aims to raise funds for a cause that will affect one in seven Australian women before their 85th birthday. From zero to over 200 in less than 10 seconds. Almost the same amount of time it took for a breast cancer diagnosis to send Andy Kale's life into a spin. One day I was uh, looking at going drag racing in my brand new uh, car and the next day I was looking at hospital appointments and surgeries and treatments and uh, my whole life just turned upside down. Ten years on and armed with a new set of wheels, this drag race has turned her attention to raising funds and hope for those facing a similar fight. They can pay for a ride in the car or they'll be able to buy a ride that we can donate to a family who's going through a tough time. Anything to put your mind off the situation and to have something to look forward to is always um, a good thing. It's been a labour of love assembly mama's toy, but after a three-year build, the streetcar honouring those who succumb to the disease is ready for passengers, including myself. Probably a bit of a shock. Um, and uh, a lot of adrenaline and a pretty big cheesy grin when they get uh, come down the return road. So I would be watching out for that big smile. Of course, with anything like this, safety is important. So the harness is on, the helmet is on. Wish me luck, Andy. It's over to you. While the ride might be over in seconds, the money raised could bring lifelong changes for patients and families supported by Breast Cancer Care WA. A specialist breast care nursing, counselling, financial, practical support, we have support groups, um, so it's really going to a good cause. A cause this survivor thinks is worth driving home. Ashley Nelson for 10 News First. All right, everyone, so let's get ready to introduce 
all the way from, to, uh, from Australia, Andy Kale. Hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm very good. Thank you very much for inviting me along. Yes, and good morning to you guys. It is uh, f like 5 in the morning over there, 5.30 in the morning over there. So um, thank you for <laughs> being on a Wednesday. It's still Tuesday here in the United States for us. So thank you for uh, waking up bright and early. They said the early worm catches the, the early bird catches the worm. So thank you for <laughs> rising early up with us today. So let's get into it. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. So yes, we saw the clip um, about, you know, you're doing the drag racing and we do know that you're a breast cancer survivor, but who is Andy? Um, I Like I said, like you said in the intro, I am just a regular girl who loves motorsport. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer um, shortly before I purchased my first or just after I purchased my first race car mm -hmm. but I hadn't actually learned how to be a race car driver yet so it was sort of I was just learning how to be a race car driver getting ready to do my license and everything like that um, and then suddenly got diagnosed with breast cancer um, wow. so everything had to get put on hold um, and but during the treatment and during that whole process, I still had, I had that goal in mind. Uh, I've got to get behind the wheel. I've still got this, I've got this thing I've got to achieve. There's, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's something there waiting for me. Um, so it was, it, it was that goal. It was that, uh, that aim um, that helped me get through. That's awesome. Tell us a little bit about your uh, testimony about how did you discover breast cancer and what was your treatment like? So discovering the breast cancer was, it was just pure, uh, pure chance. Um, mm. I, it was in the shower one night. Um, I just, I noticed that there was a bit of a lump on the side of my breast. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think much of it. Uh, I'd had some cysts before. I was uh, quite, quite large anyway. So uh, quite prone to having cysts. Um, mm -hmm. so I thought, no, that's probably all it is. But something, something within me sort of said, no, ask, ask your husband to have a check. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm very close with him. And, and, and he said, no, no, that, that's, that doesn't seem right. You need to go and get the doctor to have a look at it. Um, so I went and saw my doctor who, he's been my doctor since I was like 16 years old. So, uh, he knows me very, very well. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, that doesn't seem like a cyst to me. Um, mm -hmm. I want to send you off to get a mammogram. Went to get a mammogram. They couldn't find it. Wow. Uh, nothing showed up on the mammogram. Um, so then they sent me off to for an ultrasound and bang, there it was. Um, yeah. Yeah nice great big what I like to call a great big dust bunny because it just looked like a big <laughs> dust bunny <laughs> yeah like a big cotton ball in there yeah <laughs> yeah yeah big cotton ball um and yeah after, after that it, it just yeah it, it was just one thing after another it was just doctors and surgeries and treatments and and specialist appointments and yeah it was just like being on a roller coaster after that Wow. Um, one of the things that you said was, you know, you found it in the shower. I actually found mine in the shower, too. So, you know, it, I always advocate, especially during the beginning of the month, to really make sure that you are uh, doing a self-exam um, because breast cancer, you don't you don't have to get breast cancer by uh if it runs in your family or even if you have the BRCA gene, um, it, it could just happen to you. So it's very important for you to be very familiar with your whole body, not just your breast, but if anything. So if you have any type of lumps or anything like that, um, that you're seeing about it. But we was talking a little bit earlier about um, to not only just look for lumps, just look for other signs. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Um, any sort of changes I have. Uh, since met other ladies, uh, one lady had a rash on her neck mm. um, and that ended up, it was the lymph nodes uh, reacting to the breast cancer and the breast cancer was so deep, in, the tumour was so deep in her breast 
that she would never have felt it and it wasn't yeah. going to turn up on the mammograms, but uh, the lymph nodes were reacting and she ended up with this continuous rash on her neck. Um, so there's lots of different things. It's just being aware of any changes that you see in your body and yes. getting them checked out because you know your body. It, it's not a case of uh, wait, rely on the mammogram or rely on the doctor's exam because you're the one that's seeing your body every single day in the shower. Absolutely. I like two things. I like that, um, you know, you saw about it, but then also that after the mammogram didn't pull anything, that your um, your health healthcare team also took that step further and made sure that they did the ultrasound because it could have been missed that they would have just only relied on the mammogram. So go with your gut feeling. If you know something is off, make sure that you're an advocate for yourself. So if that physician or nurse aide that is... Um, just want to go off of that one test and you still feel like something's wrong, you have the right to make sure that you are advocating for yourself um, to make sure all that as well. I even be transparent, like something as recent as last week for me, um, I noticed a change in my breast. I had um, an, an additional bump that was there and I was like, okay, I don't know what's going on. I notice if it's there for more than a few weeks, then yes, I need to go see about it. So it ended up being a month and I scheduled my appointment um, with my breast surgeon since, you know, after you have cancer, you have this whole team for life, right? So I don't have to go straight to the OBGYN anymore. I could go straight to the breast surgeon. So I had scheduled my appointment with her and she looked at it and she was like, no, this is fine. But the point of it is, is to know your body, to know those changes, to know um, if something has changed. Um, so you're able to go see about it because what I've learned, um, the earlier you see about it, the less aggressive treatment that you may have to go through. Um, there's 15 different type of breast cancers. Not all breast cancer are the same and not all treatment methods are the same. So let's talk about the treatment methods. How long was your treatment methods and what all did you have to do? Um, so I started with a lumpectomy. Um, so mm -hmm. I, was, I was in surgery within a couple of weeks of being diagnosed. Um, they didn't get clear margins. Um, so they then gave me the choice. And, you know, I'm looking at two, three weeks after diagnosis of having cancer, and they're then giving me the choice. Do you want to go in and try for uh, a more, take more from the breast, mm -hmm. or do you want to have a mastectomy? And that's a massive decision to have to make yes. uh, when you're still coming to terms with the fact that you've got cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so my first reaction was, oh, no, I want to keep my breasts. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's yours. <laughs> yeah, they're mine. They're mine. We have a relationship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so they went back in um, to see if they could get more, uh, more of the tumour. They did end up getting more of the tumour, but what they did find in the process is that I had what they call DCIS, which is mm -hmm. um, what I like to think of as um, pre-cancerous um, mm -hmm. cells um, throughout the rest of the breast. Yes. So they did say then that um, I would probably have to have the breast removed, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't urgent anymore. Um, so then the process was to go through chemo, mm -hmm. um, but because the type of cancer that I had, uh, was very aggressive, um, and they also decided that it was going to be an 80% chance of coming back. Mm. Um, so they did a, um, a very new treatment, which I see a lot of people are using now, but, uh, in 2010, it, it had only just come off trial. So um, I went for a very aggressive treatment um, for about six months. Mm. Um, uh, chemotherapy every single week. Um, wow, for six so months. I, yeah, so I, I spent uh, quite a lot of time in hospital um, struggling with the treatment. Uh, mm -hmm. And the time that I wasn't in hospital, I was on the couch <laughs> watching, <laughs> watching daytime TV, um, yeah. as, as you do. Um, and then followed that up with the radiation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then after that, then there was the surgery. Um, 
by that point, I had already spoken to my husband. We'd had the conversation. I'd come to terms with the fact uh, about the cancer. Um, and I decided that I wanted to have the other breast removed as well. So I didn't want to have any risks. Mm -hmm. So then I did the, so we had, I had both them removed and then had immediate reconstruction. Um, so I had the silicon implants put in straight away. So it was just that one single surgery. And then after that, yes, on drugs for 10 years. Um, yes. And, uh, yeah, so now I don't take any drugs and don't. Um, That's yeah. good. So it's all, we're going to talk about that. Yes, we're going <laughs> to talk about that because, look, you're speaking my language. I still have, what, uh, seven years to go before I'm off of those drugs. But I just want to clear up a little bit of medical jargon just in case if our roses don't know what that is. So looking for clear margins is when they are taking the cancer out, so just think of the cancers, that little cotton ball that we uh, talked about earlier. So sometimes there could be a little residual around the tissue, around uh, your breast tissue. So they will take, you know, their their medical equipment and scrape around to make sure that there is no trace of the cancer there. So that's what clear margins mean. And DCIS is ductal carcinoma in C2. So that is what that precancerous thing is as well. So there, again, that's 15 different types. That's one of the 15 different types of cancer. You got that. You got an uh, invasive, invasive ductal carcinoma. There's so many different kinds um, and different variations. Some people um, struggle with triple negative breast cancer while uh, others are doing the IDC that I just spoke of. Um, so one thing that I want to do is a parallel because this is an international show, just the length of time that treatment was. So yours, I will roughly say, sound like it was getting close to a year, if not a year. And yep. ours is about the same too. So, you know, rest assured that those in the United States and those who are in Australia, that uh, we are getting the same adequate health care and attention that you need. There's no quick fix, unfortunately, with that. But again, sometimes if you find it early enough, you may not have to go through all of those aggressive treatments. It kind of really depends on the grade of your cancer, how fast it's spreading, all those different things come into an account of how cancer is going to be treated with that. So talk about what's life after cancer, after you have to take these drugs, because these drugs are so hard in your joints and your muscles and your mood swings and things like that. What is it like on the other side? Oh, on the other side, it is it is absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, that that fact that I don't have to take I'm I'm not really a um, a medication type person. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't like to take um, headache tablets or supplements or anything really. Um, so being having to take that tablet every single morning, uh, it was just it was like, oh, when is this going to end? <laughs> um, but yeah, coming off it and um, was brilliant. And I only actually came off it at the beginning of this year. Wow, uh, so it, it has yeah so it has been has been a fairly fairly new process but m my brain seems to be opening up and the fog is lifting and i and and i feel like i'm me again as well so it is it's very very good that is so good to hear um i always wondered how long it takes for your body to recognize it doesn't have it in the system anymore. For, when you have to take something for up to 10 years, you will almost think that you need a good year or two for your body to be like, hey, I'm free. I don't have to you know, <laughs> do this anymore. But, so it's really good to hear that uh, with you coming as early as this, this year, that you are already starting to feel better and the brain fog is starting to go away because that's for the birds. It's so hard. <laughs> always forget when you walk into a room what you're trying to do and all these different things. So let's talk about Therapy on Wheels a little bit. So you talked about how this community uh, was really supportive for not only you, but for your husband. How was it like for your husband? It was really, really difficult. Um, my husband is a fix-it guy. He likes to fix things. He likes to make mm -hmm. things and repair things. And when I got diagnosed with cancer, his immediate 
the thought was, well, I can fix this. And mm -hmm. then he sat there and went, well, hang on a second. I'm not a doctor. I can't fix this. I don't know how to fix this. Um, and so he, he mentally, he went into shutdown mode. He didn't know mm -hmm. how to deal with it. He didn't know how to deal with his emotions and all this gamut of emotions that he was feeling. He is a very blokey bloke. Um, he doesn't like to go to counselling sessions or therapy sessions. He doesn't like to talk about his feelings. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we often joke about it. it's a very Australian bloke thing um, that they don't like to share their feelings. Mm -hmm. But he did, uh, in a way, he did share his feelings because hanging out with the motorsport guys, hanging out in the workshops, um, you know, one of one person would say, so how's the wife doing? And, and he mm -hmm. go, oh, you know, she's struggling or she's doing this treatment. And he would manage to get that off his chest. He would come home and he'd be all um, puffed up and, and, and re-energised and, and re-motivated and, and ready to be able to face another day of doctors and surgeries and looking after yeah. me again. Explain so it, how that was beneficial for you because um, to be able to get that, for him to get that support, I know that that made you feel good that you had an extension to be able to offer him kind of indirectly. Uh, but how, how was that helpful for you at home? So when you were at on the couch watching the daytime television, how, how did that help? It was good because I didn't have to worry about uh, what I was going through and how it was affecting him. I could focus on getting well and, and, worrying about my own treatment and focusing on on my improvement and of course on on my own mental health as well I had to you know you've got to be strong you've got to be focused mm -hmm. and if you're worrying about everybody around you and and how your behavior and your illness is affecting them then that's affecting how um, how mm -hmm. focused and how strong you can be yourself I absolutely love um the support system that you both have um, with that and speak to someone out there who is struggling to open up or um, trying to navigate how to build a support system if they don't naturally have that at home. There are a lot of people that don't have that um, support system at home and that's why I, I like to volunteer with an organisation that does give that personal support. Um, you know, I, I drive, as a volunteer, I drive people to their appointments and I'll sit there when they're going through their chemo or for their first surgery. And then you do just naturally open up and start chatting. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you, you know, I do know some people will take the bus to chemo or a taxi. Uh, if they don't have that support network, mm -hmm. but do reach out to, um, you know, to your church or to a support group uh, who have the volunteer drivers, because sitting sitting there in a car with somebody uh, in the traffic on the way to your appointment, you will naturally start to talk. Um, and if there is somebody else who's been through it, it's a lot easier to open up. And sometimes it's easier to open up to somebody who's been through it than it is to a family member Excellent. or to the medical team mm -hmm. often you don't want to open up to the medical team because you go oh maybe they'll make me go take more drugs or do more treatment or or maybe it's really serious and you start mm -hmm. getting worried you don't want to open up to family because you don't want to scare them or worry them or make them any more concerned than they are right yeah sometimes it could be hard to open up to the medical staff because you don't want to seem like um, you're asking too many questions. Like, even though like you have the right to ask that, sometimes you want to be like, okay, I don't want to seem like I'm bothering them. I know I'm not the only cancer <laughs> patient that they yeah. have to, to, to deal with, but you know, like we really want to get that. I know for at least uh, for myself, I was given almost, I called it like a medical Bible almost. It was like, it had like all of the medical terms on there. So I was able to read um, the diagnostic report so I could really understand all the medical jargon that was used in that report, the pathology report, I'm sorry. Uh, so I was able to really dissect what uh, that was. Um, and to it had a, a slot for all the business cards that you get. You can almost play cards with them because you get so many of that. So it was just like all of that in one spot. 
So that kind of helps. So I didn't necessarily have to ask a lot of questions, but God bless you for volunteering for uh, driving people to their appointments and surgeries, because some people really don't realize that um, cancer survivors don't have someone to take them because sometimes it's too taxing to drive yourself. But then, you know, you don't want to bother your family members because they have jobs and they might have children to raise and they have other responsibilities. So they're kind of in this uh, stuck in this hard place of how are they going to be able to get the the treatment that they need uh, to be able to give them the self care that they need to fight this thing, um, and and try to figure out how they're going to get there. So I think that's really and, good. And it's a, it's a very big ask, especially when it's radiation and you're going every single day. Yes, yes, so absolutely. It's a very big, even if you do have that support team of um, a big family around you, it's a big ask to ask somebody to take you to a treatment every single day. Absolutely. And, you know, someone's like, well, no, it's OK. No, it's not. Because just chemo alone, you mentioned yours was six months. Mine was about four, almost five months. It was really five months, actually. So like asking someone to commit to at least weekly on that, let alone then there's the next phase. <laughs> you know, you got the 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 surgery phase and then you got the reincision phase and then you got the radiation phase. So you're absolutely right. It is such a big ask. And some people really want to be able to do that. And sometimes as survivors, we have to open up a little bit more and allow people to help us. Um, however, you know, I, I know for me, I don't want to feel like I'm a burden on anybody. So that's like I like I I literally I legit drove myself to my treatments. I don't you know how I'd made it, but it was like really hard. Like my, the, the nurse was like, how did you drive yourself? And I was like, I just made it home. I'm only like <laughs> five to 10 minutes away from the hospital. So I just, I just did it. And, you know, sometimes my husband drove me or my mother had drove me when she was still alive. Uh, she'll drive me. So, but yeah, absolutely. Asking family and friends to do that is a lot for that. Mm -hmm. uh, with that. So Let's go a little bit more into therapy on wheels and tell me about, okay, once you were able to get back into that car, tell me about the adrenaline rush. Cause I know there's an adrenaline rush for those to get in the car and experience it, but how was your first adrenaline rush after dealing with cancer? Oh, it was fantastic. They, um, that whole time of waiting to get in the car, um, I would even, I would sit in the car when I was going through a treatment, I would sit in the car in the workshop and you just had those residual fuel smells and rubber smells and just general motorsport smells. And I would uh -huh. you know, bring them in by osmosis. Um, but once I finally made it to the track um, and that first, that first rush, it was just, you couldn't wipe the smile off my face. It was huge. <laughs> It, it wasn't going to go away. Um, and reaching the, yeah, reaching the end of the track. Um, yeah, I was, I was actually shaking, but it was with adrenaline, not with, mm -hmm. not with nerves. I was just so excited um, and, and felt like a little kid as soon as I got yeah. back. It was, it was like, again, again, again. Yeah. <laughs> Did it feel like a victory lap for you? Because to be able to get back into the car again, to do something that you love to do, um, to be able to just experience all of that and soak that in, did it feel like it was a victory lap for you? Oh, yes, definitely. And and not just for me. There were so many people that had supported um, uh, myself and my husband throughout, uh, throughout that journey. Um, and we'd picked up a lot of extra friends along the way who helped us get there. And they were all standing on the start line and supporting. And it was, um, yeah, it was a victory awesome. for everybody. Yeah. I know everyone had to have the tissues out for that. Well, yours probably blew <laughs> off from the speed that you were <laughs> <laughs> So tell me about the cancer survivors that end up in your car. How does that process work and how are they able to join? So it's not just for cancer survivors, it's also for the carers um, oh, and awesome. for, the for the family. So, um, but uh, yeah, cur currently the, we've, uh, one, the very first person that we had in the car was a cancer survivor. Um, and yeah, in her own words, it's, uh, it was a great experience for her to have that celebration. Um, 
to say, yes, I'm all clear. I'm, um, yes, this, I'm, I'm ready to move on with my life and that part of my life is over and, and, and let's celebrate. Let's do something crazy and wild and, and fun. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So we, we basically we basically allow people to come onto the website. They can they can either book a ride for themselves or for a family friend. Um, and we also have the option where they can um, they can purchase a ride and then what we do is we donate it to somebody. So you can actually say, Well, great, I can't afford a ride, but I know somebody who is really worthy because they've looked after their wife or they've looked after their mum or or something like that um, and they could really use an uplifting experience as a thank you for what they've done um, so so we take on people like that and then we'll donate the rides to them as a thank you that's awesome guys make sure you like comment and share this because there's someone in Australia what one thing that I like I told her I have to fly out there because there's nothing like this program uh, we we um, just chat about this earlier before the show to see if this is in different parts of the world if it's in Europe if it's in the United States and there's really nothing like it so if you want to have this unique experience make sure you take a trip over to Australia and to get this because I think it will be very beneficial and if you are watching from Australia please utilize this great resource I think this is amazing um, to be able to have that um, to have that victory lap um, to be able to get all those nerves out because one thing cancer does it stresses you out sometimes um, the whole process through the treatments and even for your family members, it, it, it's a lot to deal with. Um, and if you don't have that support system, you do need an outlet. So it's really important to make sure that you are giving yourself that self-care uh, to be able to do that. And I, I'm just so thankful for uh, the volunteering that you do, the uh, the the driving that you do. I think that's amazing. I, I don't think I can, I, I know how to drive, but you know, I don't know if I can handle those, those high speed. How fast do you go? um it's 200 zero to 200 kilometers per hour yes you know i can't oh, oh, <laughs> that's fine. i know they say when you hit the corners you like i think you have to like focus inward or something like that so you don't crash is that true am i right oh, we don't we don't do corners we we basically with drag okay. racing we say if you can do corners you're not going fast enough <laughs> oh god all right <laughs> Yeah. So, well, that, that, well, you know, I think that will also put the ease on those who want to do the drive. They don't have to worry about flying off on their side of the ramp and things like that. Oh my gosh. So what inspired you to, to be a part of this organization to, or even to even drive uh, different survivors to their appointments? I wanted, uh, when I was going through the treatment, I had a great, great support network. Um, both family and through the motorsport, because I was already connected uh, through the motorsport. Um, but I did notice uh, through my support groups that there were a lot of people out there that didn't have that network of people around them. Um, you know, whether they, um, you know, I've since come across people that have been diagnosed while they're traveling or mm -hmm. they um, or they live away from their family or they're estranged from their family or some some people just don't want to bother their family yeah um, so they they so they don't have that support network and they're not aware of how much that they actually need so uh, I wanted to be able to give back in some way um, and and help people that didn't have that weren't as lucky as me and didn't have that support network around um, so, yeah, so I reached out and uh, found an organisation that had the same ethics as me um, mm -hmm. and had the same ideas and uh, wanted to help people directly and personally um, as they needed. That's good. It's definitely important to make sure that you connect with an organization that shares your same morals and ethics um, just because it just helps things to just flow a little bit better. I, I love that. Do you have repeat um survivors or caregivers or just people who just want to get in the car and, and go again? <laughs> oh, everybody wants to uh, relive the experience as soon as, oh. as soon as they reach the end of the track. It is a case of, oh, I want to do that again because I know what to expect now. 
Wow, that's so I, I I think the problem is that you're so so nervous at the beginning um, because you don't know what to expect. So mm -hmm. once you get to the end, it's okay. I'm ready now. I could do it again. That's awesome. That is awesome. So tell us a little bit about the healthcare system in uh, Australia. So you mentioned uh, some new, some breaking news that uh, for mammograms. Share share that news. Absolutely. The we have a great public health system over here, um, but one of the problems has been with the mammograms is that it's only free to get a mammogram if you are over fifty. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of women under 50 get diagnosed and they miss out because they can't afford to go mm -hmm. for their regular mammograms. Um, so it has now been changed that uh, you get free mammograms if you're over 40. That's amazing. So it is, uh, it is widely being encouraged for women once you reach 40, go and get those free mammograms go and get checked out um, still do self-testing but yes. um, yeah but get that extra extra bit of imaging on a regular basis make a day of it make an experience of it um, mm -hmm. I That's have I have one friend who um, on her sister's birthday unfortunately her sister passed with breast cancer mm -hmm. but she uses her sister's birthday uh, she goes for it she gets dressed up she does a lunch uh, lunch date with her niece and they go and get their mammogram once a year in the city uh, it's a really really nice screening place um, oh, awesome. and uh, yeah they, they make a make a big day of it so yeah if you if you sort of have that special occasion um, it's it's well worth bringing in and, and, and in making an enjoyment out of it. That's good. That's a good way of honoring, you know, her legacy, um, a, you know, something that could be painful to do because that could remind you of, of how she passed to be able to have the strength to say, Hey, you know, she will want us to make sure that we're proactive in this and to choose that date, I think is very symbolic to do that. Um, I know sometimes those who are dealing with, uh, loved ones who have lost uh, their their battle to cancer. And I shouldn't say lost their battle. They won it in a different way. Uh, so those who are going through those transitions, you know, find something to be able to honor your loved one who has a uh, transition due to cancer. So if it's making a recipe, if it's uh, choosing a, a, a specific date to get taste testing done and things like that, use those different things because I think that also helps the grieving process as well. What do you think about that? Oh, absolutely. It, it does help with the grieving process. It's, um, it, it's honoring the person rather than um, uh, letting your emotions uh, take over and drag you down. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's see. Um, we have really like plowed through a lot of material. I'm like really excited about this. So like we, we've got so much that's in here. So first, let's talk about Australians. So make sure if you are 40 and up, there's no excuse. Please make sure that you go see about yourselves and get your yearly mammograms. Those in the United States, um, our recommended age to start getting um, mammograms is at 40, even though I advocate under 40, um, especially in certain communities in the African-American community, um, I would like to push and see legislation passed for at least 35, maybe even 30 years old, because I'm starting to see a lot of African-American uh, women, unfortunately, getting um, cancer in their 30s. So if you wait until 40 to get a mammogram, <laughs> then, you know, we, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I was 34 when I was diagnosed with cancer. So Make sure that um, you use those resources, even though ours isn't free. There's different programs that's out there. Um, there's mobile uh, mammogram centers uh, um, that you can go to that's free. Um, different counties have different free um, things as well. And then see how much your insurance has. And if you have dense breasts, ask for that 3D mammogram too, because that takes a more in-depth look of what those tissues look like. Because if you have a history of a lot of cysts, such as Andy, such as myself, if you have dense breasts, that 3D will really help kind of see a little bit deeper what's going on. Um, and then also it couples with that ultrasound to really make sure that 
your images are coming up clean and then that you can have that peace of mind. And just because you also had your mammogram does that does not mean that you stopped your monthly exams. There's been individuals that had a, a yearly exam and then six months later, unfortunately, they had cancer. So please make sure that you continue to do your self exams to um, make sure that, you know, you are on top of everything. And that's, I think that's just a form of self-care. So let's dive into self-care. What does self-care look like to you? Um, for me, it's um, making sure that you're mentally, mentally well um, and being finding something that you're passionate about so that you can recharge those mental uh, mental batteries mm -hmm. um, find something that's going to make you smile something that makes you happy something that yes. gets you out of the house and gets you a little bit active for me it's motorsport obviously mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. uh, it but it can be anything it can be going down the park and feeding the ducks it can be playing with the kids it might be um, playing with a sport or going for a run um, helping out at the church or the library it's um, volunteering it's it is a case of find something that makes you makes you sing makes you happy and and, and 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 do that and focus on that and uh yeah that'll make you that, that looks after the mental health and i'm a big advocate of um the carers uh focusing on that as well because carers do have a tendency to go well i'm not the sick one Focus mm -hmm. on them. I'm all good. I'm okay. Yes. Um, whereas they carers really do struggle, and uh, they will often struggle a lot harder than the person that they're caring for because mm -hmm. they're not looking after their own their own well being. Yes, that's a very good point. It's it's it, it affects the whole family, um, especially if there's kids involved. Um, some. Yeah individuals are private about their battle while others are public and transparent to their children about their their battle so whatever route that you take just make sure like you talked about doing different things that um will help take that stress the mental stress off of the family so um if your family is open to therapy use that if not, you got the most sport. <laughs> okay. So there's different <laughs> avenues that you could uh, take to do that, but make sure that you are seeing about your mental health because cancer is just not a physical. I think I say this almost every show. Cancer is just not a physical disease. It also affects you emotionally as well as mentally as well, not only for the survivor, but for the carers and for their families and anyone who's um, connected to that. Um, it's really important to make sure that um, mentally that you are strengthening yourself because um, I know for at least for myself, I had suffered from survivor's guilt. Um, in my case, when I was battling uh, stage three breast cancer, both of my parents also had cancer at the same time as me. And while I was still in active treatment, uh, my dad died first. And then my mom was diagnosed with uh, stage four lung cancer right after him, like literally a week after he um, we buried him. And then she died 82 days later after him. They had different cancers. He had bladder, she had lung cancer. So for me, both being a survivor as well as a caregiver, um, it was a lot to deal with and to digest everything that was going on to me. So it's, I, we, I cannot stress it enough how important it is to make sure that you are uh, doing the necessary self-care that you're checking with your children because I know it affected mine and I had to make sure that I provided them resources and make sure they were in activities to do different things. But then also for my husband as well, because like you said, with your husband, you know, they want to make sure that they are the protectors, they are the fix it, uh, uh, and to make sure that they are providing a situation to just make things as comfortable for the survivor, but then they're neglecting themselves. And there's only so much we can do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're trying not to throw up in the toilet. <laughs> so, you know, um, really make sure that um, you do that. So before we go into the last segment of the show where we get to talk about, um, you know, more of what you do and uh, different highlights or if there's any fundraisers or anything that's going on, what is something that you will leave as a lasting reminder um, or message to a survivor and or their families? Find a reason to smile. Um, it, it can be very, very difficult. 
uh, especially through the darkest days. Um, but you do need you need that focus. Um, one of the best pieces of advice that I was given was find that focus and have a picture of it in the front of your diary. Now, you mentioned that you had this great big diary full of all your business cards and mm -hmm. all, all, your, all your reports and everything. And yeah, I was exactly the same. Uh, I was an information junkie. Um, I wanted every piece of yes. information, every single report, every single, every single printout. Um, but in the very front of that diary, there was that focus. Uh, for me, it was the race car and it was a reminder that as soon as I was given the all clear to get on the track and do that racing, um, that was my goal, that was my focus and that was what I was aiming for. And if you've got that focus and uh, you've got that reason to smile, yes. Um, then yes, that will help you through the darkest days. Yes, it will. I absolutely love that smiling does help heal the soul, but then also having something to look forward to is amazing as well, because that gives you a, a will to fight. So when you have those, those dark days, when you just feel like, okay, chemo is starting to be a little bit too much, <laughs> going to the hospital every day for radiation is starting to be a little bit too much. You can look at that in your case, the, the, the race car as a reminder I got to keep on going, looking at your husband. I got to keep on going. So find your why and then focus on that. So I love that. And that is different for everybody. So, you know, what works for Andy may not work for you. What works for Kim may not work for you. So find whatever works for you. But what's universal definitely is smiling, smiling and focusing. But what you focus on is, is unique to you. Man, I really enjoyed our time together. This was amazing. Thank you. Thank I you. Want I just want to say that, you know, sometimes when we are in different countries, sometimes we feel that we cannot relate to someone because our cultures may be different, the way um, our, our experience is different. But this show is really a highlight to show that, A, it doesn't matter what country you're in, you can still get cancer. And really your treatment methods are not different, but then the ways to recover is not different because we all smile, we all hurt, we all have different uh, emotions and things like that. That's the same. So I like this because it just really shines a light and kind of uh, erases any myths that there is differences. Yes, you know, the way your buildings look might look a little bit different there or the way how you prepare your food might be a little bit different here or the slang that you may use uh, might be a little bit different over here. But the, we're all humans and we all have a very similar, unique experience that we can all come together um, in unity and to be able to uh, help each other with that. So I'm so excited for having you on here. Please share with our listeners what's next for you. Well, at the moment, it is the off season because we're going into winter. So the car has to uh, go back in the shed. Um, but in the meantime, during the off season, I go out and have a chat to different clubs, different groups, um, go and talk to schools about the importance of one, finding your passion, finding your reason to smile. Mm -hmm. And the other, doing those self-checks, getting in early and, and find it, finding uh, just finding the breast cancer early so that you can get that treatment early and get through it quickly. Um, and uh, then in October, we'll be back on the track and taking uh, more passengers down the drag strip and, and giving more smiles and giving people more reasons to smile. That's awesome. So you mentioned you're getting ready to go into winter. So from this time in the year, it's, it's colder weather. Uh, uh, yeah, it is cold. Um, not as cold as you guys get it in Michigan. Uh, we don't <laughs> get snow here. Um, but yes, it does get it does get cold. But the the big thing is it gets wet, and uh, it's not safe to do the drag racing when it's wet. Um, mm -hmm. So we the track closes for a few months. Um, but uh, yeah, as soon as it's open, we'll be back out there again and uh, creating smiles again. So. Um, yeah. That's awesome. You know, that's one of the things I like about hearing different perspectives from uh, different parts of the world, because, you know, for us, 
Uh, we are entering into where we're in spring right now, getting ready to get into our hotter seasons. Those who are closer to the West Coast of the um, United States are already in summer mode temp wise uh, for them. So it's almost kind of like vice versa. So when it gets to October, while it's getting back cold for us and we're getting to get ready to go into winter, you guys are now into spring. So. <laughs> So I know what time of the year. So if I want to avoid the cold here, I'll go in October. Uh, so October for us is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. That would be a great time to head over same, to Australia. Same, yeah. Oh, yep. awesome. So then we'll yep. be able to go where it's warmer weather and things like that. Make sure that you are following um, the website there, <laughs> www.therapyonwheels.asn.au. Also, make sure on all platforms, doesn't matter if it's Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, she says to go ahead and search Therapy <laughs> on Wheels. Use the hashtag Therapy on Wheels on all socials, and then you will find her there. So, again, if you want to be able, if you're in Australia, you want to have that special ride, I'm not even going to say Australia. If you are anywhere part of the world and you are willing to fly to Australia, if you're not local, <laughs> please take this time to head over to this website to make sure that you schedule time to get that adrenaline rush where you're not going around the corners flying off. You're going to go straight, straight <laughs> really fast and have an amazing, amazing time. But I have enjoyed having you on here. I think it's just, just a testament of how, um, again, it doesn't matter uh, what part of the world that you're in, you're able to help inspire someone. Uh, that's how I actually found you. I found you on LinkedIn, uh, uh, which is doing some research. And I wanted to find different individuals who were open about their cancer journey. Um, I try not to just only find people for, with breast cancer. I just seem to always run into <laughs> breast cancer survivors. <laughs> but um, I just try to find people who are just open and transparent with their story. Our last guest um, uh, opened up about testicular cancer. And, um, and, and actually last month was uh, Testicular Cancer Awareness Month. And just really just sharing experiences of, of just cancer, because not all one cancer is the same. Not all the treatments for the different cancers are the same. But it's just so important because there's still too many people who are not taking the self-care seriously. Almost every single guest on the show has said that they found their cancer through self-exam. Some of them put them off and they had more aggressive treatments while others um, saw about it right away. But most of them have found it through either the testing, uh, the, the routine testing, or they found the self-exam. But they all have said the same message and making sure that you're proactive with those things. And there's some people who are scared. But even if you are scared, your life is on the line. Please make sure that you are always seeing about yourself and um, doing the necessary steps to make sure that um, you're healthy. Any last minute comments that you want to say before we head off? Just to add to that is, um, yes, it is scary if you find something, but the sooner you deal with it, often the easier the treatment can be and the more chance that you've got of survival by treating it early and dealing with it early. Yes, absolutely. As we are getting ready to... Um, uh, close out the show. Um, so those, I know it's early in Australia. They may not catch this live until later on. So if you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to put it in the comments. Um, it will still be available on LinkedIn, Facebook, and on YouTube. You can see it on those different channels. Again, I will put that up there so you're able to see all of that. You'll see survivorscorner.net if you want to continue to connect with me and what I offer. I offer international shipping for anything that you may need, or even if it's with the styling, I offer that globally as well. But this show would not be the show without you guys. And one of the ways that you guys help is by donating. So with the shirts that you see behind me, every time someone purchased one of those shirts, one of them is getting donated to someone who is going through active treatment. So if it is on your heart to actually donate for that, that is something that you could do. You could scan it from there, or you could take a snapshot and then you could scan from there to be able to donate um, to the cause uh, for that. So we are getting ready to wrap up for the show next week. We're going to have Dr. Ingrid Johnson and we will be uh, on Monday at back at noon and we are going to Easter Standard Time and go from there. So again, Andy, thank you so much for being here. And until next time, hold on, let me see. We got a comment out there. Hold on, Sharon Davis-Carthorne says, self-care is so important. Thank you for sharing your journey. 
Thank you, Sharon, for uh, joining us today. And she's also a fellow breast cancer survivor and uh, Get Into It, a featured guest as well. So without further ado, I hope you all have a blessed day. And until next week, we'll see you next time. Thank you.